friends and audience and everybody, welcome to a, a session that I have personally looked very much forward to for two reasons. One reason is uh, always interesting to see how Tune's hair uh, is developing during the <laughs> pandemic, of course. <laughs> the The second reason is because, uh, Andrew, you and I, we have met at so many trade shows so many times, and I really like hanging out with you. But this is actually the first time that we are working together, right? It is. We, we've met a few times in places with alcohol. We've no. met on trade show floors. Well, I seem to remember the Irish bar. No, 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 no. Can't remember. It wasn't no. Horton, wasn't no, it? it was me. It was me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, it's it's good to be here. Yeah, we've met many, many times and have many, many conversations. But I, it's my my first time, which is something that I can't say very often. So. <laughs> 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 no, that is uh, absolutely true. Um, before we are going into the session, um, I can't help think about because I mean there has been some uh, recent uh, changes in at in focus. Uh, we did a, a, a wonderful interview with uh, your new boss, uh, Thomas Van Rossum, who is not to be in, uh, confirmed with Toon Van Rossum. Uh, actually, uh, um, our good friend uh, Deborah Korn, you know her. She was like. Is two now the managing director of? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, it's Thomas. Yeah, but the surname. I said, there's a U and not an O in the. In, oh, okay. <laughs> so, so uh, maybe that's an opportunity for you to step up in the organization next time. Who knows, right? <laughs> but uh, all the changes in in at in focus. Uh, I think that every time you have, uh, and it's not because you do it often. It's just because uh, we get aged, all of us. Um, I was just thinking that every time you have a new management it also seems to be a little bit of a new direction not a new direction product wise but how you keep developing into a market that must be extremely interesting for in focus these uh, years, these years where automation and workflow is becoming a more and more essential part of the printing companies uh, how do you see that um, uh, andrew yeah i think um you know um obviously it's not completely new because thomas has been been with us in uh, in other capacities so um it's a it's a transition rather than a, a complete yeah. change but it's it's a good opportunity to reset and reevaluate and um you know as you say um watch this space there's um lots of discussions going on mm -hmm. and um it it's although it's a you know quite a bad time in the industry it's also quite a good time because there's so much change going on. i was watching this the earlier session with kelvin mm -hmm. and um yeah, there's a lot of opportunity out there, both for customers and, and for vendors as well. So um, it, and it's good have timing. You found, have you found the pandemic has kind of got you guys changing your direction? And obviously the drive and the interest in Inkjet currently has made you look at revisit everything? Um, not so much uh, the Inkjet side, because we, um, we actually renamed this, this presentation, but you didn't get the memo, Morton. So, what did we call it soon? You have to uh, switch off the microphone to, so we can't hear you. Yeah. yeah, so there we changed the presentation last minute uh, to we don't care about inkjet. <laughs> I didn't see that one. I'm, yeah, I'm we'll, sorry about we'll, that. Uh, we'll, ex we'll explain what it means um, later on. But, um, but yeah, not so much inkjet, but, but the industry and the way that customers are now working um, certainly uh, Early last year, we started to see a renewed or an accelerated interest in online, the online products um, and integrations. I mean, we've got a lot of integrations with VPress. We share a lot of mutual customers. So um, although we, we don't do web to print ourselves, we're very uh, aware of what's going on and the amount of uh, integrations, database connections, increased automation. Um, yeah, we, we saw a definite trend, um, mm -hmm. you know, end of q1 last year starting to develop which carried all the way through the year to be honest yeah i can't help think about uh how fortunate uh you are in that perspective that just a few years ago in focus was an entirely license based uh, uh company and and today uh quite good part of your of your revenue comes from subscription that must have been a very good move during the pandemic right yeah i think thomas told you himself that it was um it was something that uh, gave us a solid platform to, you know, keep moving forward on, which was great. And I think the one thing that Infocus did, which um, probably some others didn't, was we give customers the choice. Yeah. 
we're not subscription <laughs> only. You can you can buy a subscription, you can buy a perpetual, you buy whichever suits your cash flow, your business model, your company philosophy. Mm. So um, I think that approach has, has been rec- well well uh, received by the industry and also, you know, um, the fact we're not pushing people. Mm. It, it's kind of our, in our DNA that we're very customer focused. So, mm. um, yeah, mm. you're right. It's, it was really, really good last year. Mm. Uh, Toon, uh, now Kelvin, he, oh, sorry, not Kelvin there, uh, <laughs> Andrew, he turned off his camera. Uh, well, but um, I can't help thinking about because um, you have also been uh, involved with in focus for some time. And if you look at from from your perspective, um, uh, the market is becoming more and more dependent on on uh, workflow automation. And I think that switch uh, and, and pit stop, of course, plays a, a tremendously important part of that one. But with with uh, many years in the market, um, have you? Um, uh, it's kind of a leading question, but haven't you kind of got into a position where growth is difficult, or is it still a lot of people that are not using a workflow automation from in focus? Um, good question. I think the what we see is people diversifying more and looking for a, an automation more an automation platform than looking for an end to end workflow. Mm-hmm. Um, so as soon as they try to or decide to do or add something to their portfolio, they can easily extend their um, their workflow, their automation. They can just add a, a new piece to the puzzle. Um, and that's definitely something we've seen in the last few years. Um, if I go back to, I would say, the previous Drupa, but it's still the last Drupa. <laughs> we see that there was people where they knew they were they had to start with automation. And I think the biggest difference uh, between now and then is that they want to add more to their automation. So they started, they also diversified more um, and they're looking into ways to add it to what they're already doing. But um, but the, the, my question was more in relation to, I mean, uh, is there still printing companies out there that are not using uh, some kind of automation? I mean, is there still a potential for you guys? Uh, definitely. Um, as I said, so they, they, they started automating um, but they, I don't think they're at a place yet where they, they're comfortable and, and automating as much as they should. Um, there's still a lot of time and time to win and also a lot of errors that can be removed by adding some more or a, a next step in their automation. Actually. I can't help think about uh, Tune when uh, you and I, uh, we made an interview in Stockholm a couple of years ago. Uh, one of the, the things that we spoke about in that interview was, uh, I think you said something like, if a solution doesn't have an API, it's not really interesting to look into <laughs> something like that at oh, least. God, yeah. yeah, and I can't help thinking about it because you have actually, with the latest version of uh, Switch, you have stepped up quite considerably because now you have changed uh, the, the scripting language to something that is more commonly used right uh, indeed so I think with switch we we were like a step ahead uh, always when it came to ways that integration was possible we had scripting we could talk to web services apis and so on um, but it also means that we have to keep these technologies more or less up to date and follow there there are technology trends that we should follow as well mm. these are not trends that are specific to the printing industry they are just general technology trends. Um, and with Switch, we, we keep it up to date. And the, the scripting itself is something, I think, a few years ago, you had to be a JavaScript expert or a, almost a programmer to be, be able to do something. But it became almost like, um, I don't know, you don't have to be a computer scientist anymore. There are people, people learn JavaScript just to, to make their lives easier. <laughs> um, and it also means that certain JavaScript technologies became more or less um, I don't know, a standard. Um, and if you want to learn something, it, I think if you want to start with JavaScript, it's easy that you could take any course that is available and then apply to switch instead of learning switch specific JavaScript. Yeah. Um, so that's something we did in the last uh, year, the last two years. Yeah. Mm. And then Andrew, when uh, you uh, meet uh, customers and resellers in the market, uh, I take that this is a pro- an approach that has been uh, appreciated quite a lot, hasn't it? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, you know, there's a lot of value in it. And I, I mean, someone was asking me the other day, what, what skills does a pre-press operator have to have mm-hmm. nowadays? And, mm-hmm. you know, you can run the checkbox of InDesign and Quark and understanding PDF, but there's so much more to it now. Yeah. Um, 
uh, that people can, you know, the, the lines between IT and prepress have been blurred for for many a year, depending on what industry you came in. I mean, I used to work in the uh, work for a vendor who worked in the newspaper industry. You you don't have prepress departments there anymore. It's an IT function, and you know, mm. and it's becoming a the automation side of it is becoming a little bit more like that in in our industry, in more general, you know. Mm. And that leads me into that. We, of course, we're going to. Um, um, to get a presentation from you, I was just wondering: should we we made a remote video from uh, one of your customers, Vihapo, in the Netherlands uh, last week? Um, should we uh, should we play that now so people get a little thing, and then we can go into your presentation after that? I think that's a good idea. Uh, I don't think we've was. seen we've seen it either yet, so it'd be quite interesting for us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but it has been approved by both Vihapu and your marketing, so uh, I'm pretty right, sure that I'm you sure it's, it's wonderful, wonderful. Okay, then we watch it, and then we can uh, we can take it directly to the Oscars afterwards, and then we can talk about uh, in focus in, in while we're walking on the red carpet. Okay, okay. turn off your sound and camera, and let's see this. It's just a, like a four minutes video. My name is Robert Schechwart. Um I'm living in the Netherlands and we're uh, working at uh, Vihabo, uh, a printing company in the southern part of the Netherlands. We're doing uh, many digital projects, uh, printing uh, for all kinds of uh, customers, mostly in between uh, the web shops or that kind of uh, companies. We've got some uh, HP Indigo presses, flatbed uh, Indigo of uh, HP uh, press. Every company has its own uh, kind of products and um, their own ways of uh, delivering the orders to you. The metadata uh, about the orders is always a little different, so that, that's the challenge. And um, I guess that's where Switch comes in. Switch is, is about the, the, the backbone of our company, I guess, the digital backbone. We process an average of 1,000 jobs uh, a day. We have to get it right. We are in need of uh, good automation and uh, Switch helps us with that. We, we daily work with Switch in that case. We're using it to, for, for intake files, uh, pre-flighting, making it uh, all, all jobs meet our uh, standards, connection to our ERP system, and from there on uh, to the presses, if possible without any human intervention. And after the jobs have been completed, we also give a feedback to our customers about uh, shipments, etc. It, it is impossible. Uh, it couldn't be done manually or not to a good price. So uh, automation is absolutely necessary today. That's one scenario, um, but also uh, our customers ask for features and there are always um, ways to improve our workflow so we can always continue working uh, on that end. It differs. Uh, some customers uh, come with a, with a global ID and ask us to see uh, where it goes to and what, what the possibilities are. Other customers say, I have this kind of product and can you produce it? It has to be this and this. So, both ways. We started. I started uh, with small workflows, and uh, they grew and grew. And now there are well, over a hundred small workflows in Switch, which work together to to process all files. And it, it went from very, very simple workflow, getting files in, to uh, now very complex workflows with uh, scripting and uh, everything that's uh, possible with Switch, database connections, everything. Thank you. 
getting a job, we receive a job, uh, there's a lot of metadata with it. We form the two hour standards and then uh, that is uh, pushed to our MIS system, which will uh, be uh, used for invoicing, etc. And we get information out of the MIS system back to switch with information on how to produce a certain product. In that case, we'll, we'll take their data and we'll have to modify it to our standards and then we'll have to process the job. And in other cases, we can ask the customer to make their uh, orders uh, to our standards. Well, it's good relationships. They're usually uh, quite fast with answering uh, questions, so that's uh, very nice and they're helpful. So, uh, gentlemen and Jean, uh, I hope you like the film as well with the audience, of course. Um, <laughs> I think it was a great uh, explanation from Robert how to use Switch and how impossible it would be to run a thousand order a job a day, uh, especially for a smaller company, uh, if not uh, if it wasn't because of Switch. So that shows exactly how important a role you play in uh, in a in a company, right? Yep. Um, I also think it was nice the way he presented um, that switch was used for some small workflows, automating some small tasks, but he also mentioned some complex flows where he uses scripting and so on. So I think they really they covered the entire or the entire technical spectrum that switch is capable of of doing. Really cool, great, great. Really cool. great. I think Let's, also as well. Sorry, what I was going to say. Also as well, it was nice that it's a typical route our customers take that they start small. Yeah. And then organically build it up. They don't suddenly go in and try and do everything. Yeah. You know, it's that that small approach that, that we recommend. That you otherwise, if you try to do too much at, at once, you never you never start and you never get the value. That's true. You have prepared a presentation, and uh, I'm sorry that I didn't uh, get uh, the last minute change. But I think we don't <laughs> care about uh, inkjet. I think uh, it's a good takeaway for uh, we. <laughs> We're focusing on inkjet. <laughs> yep. So uh, why don't you take your uh, presentation uh, and get started with it? Uh, Gene and I will turn off microphone and well, cameras. Yeah. But we will be okay. Do all you have Tunes, Tunes presentation? Yeah. Tunes... Um, I'll start with screen sharing, and then we go over to your presentation. Okay. That's OK. OK? 100%. Yeah. Okay, so if everything's correct, you should see. I have a few slides just to to explain the the title because I know it's it's probably not a title you expect to see in an inchat session. Um, it's good anyway, so I like it. <laughs> yeah, I think the, the asterisk is probably the most important part of the title. Um, I'm gonna skip the presentation because yeah, thank you, Morton. You already introduced us, so. A quick thing about why we don't care about inkjet and then i really do uh, a product introduction to and focus switch although i think the movie really captured most of what i uh, want to say about switch but I'll, I'll show it more hands-on um and as mentioned before we, we talk a lot to customers we we try to understand their struggles and i think it's a good opportunity to also show us one of our biggest struggles with switch um our biggest challenge with Switch is probably the biggest win for the customer because Switch can do everything. And it's really difficult to um, to explain to, a, to, to someone who's interested in learning about Switch that he can do everything. Um, and it was also shown in the movie that you can add scripting, you could do everything that you can think of is really possible in Switch. And the limit is your imagination. And if you would look at our website, there are two ways that Switch is presented. One way is that we really try to summarize it with um, almost a solution-based, almost products that are uh, built on top of Switch. And we have uh, parts of MIS integration, proofing, uh, web to print integrations, and so on. So really trying to um, solve the, 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 the problems. And then we come up with 
uh, people in quotes uh, like this, where they don't really mention switch. They talk about the online proofing software, but the, the beneath that online proofing is still switch. The other way that switch is presented on our website is as a, is we currently, we call it the print automation rebel movement as a platform. Um, and why is it a rebel movement? Because we really try to rebel against the uh, workflow, vendor specific workflows. We really want to build something that works the way that you work. If you already have your workflow with a lot with manual steps, um, that's where switch really fits in and we can take that manual step, integrate the software that you use and make it work your way. Um, and this is the, the, I think the characteristic of switch that makes it so that you can really do everything. Um, so if you ask us, do, what do we do for inkjet? It's like, if you look at this beautiful Venn diagram, it's like inkjet is just a part of being able to do everything. Um, also, we work with integration integrators. We work with resellers that are experts in what you do. Um, they tell us what switch needs to be able to do. Um, and that's really how switch is built. So if you're using inkjet, um, switch is capable of doing what you do now. You can build on top of switch. You can even extend switch to include everything else that you do. So if you say we don't care about inkjet, it's just that we care about um, making switch uh, product that can do everything and switch is just it's just a part of everything that switch can do so i hope that sort of explains the title um, and i will just quickly go into a hands-on switch demo i'll try to keep it to a 10 minutes introduction to switch um, and i also want to ask the audience to more or less try to use your imagination because the way that switch is presented is an introduction and after that, it's really about um, the the imagination of the, the user. If you have any something that you want to automate, um, it's probably or definitely possible with Switch. So if you start with Switch, you install Switch, you have this empty canvas, you have a whole list of elements that is available. Um, a lot of defaults, switch specific elements but we the strength of switch is still the integration so all the third parties that are listed um, can be automated through switch and i will quickly go step to uh, step by step showing you how switch is capable of doing that um a very simple example like the the first thing that you should automate if you don't already automate it is file receiving so I have a, so this, the product that you see now, the view that you see now is really something that you shouldn't be using. It's the, the, the user interface of the switch server. It's not the interface that you usually would interact with, uh, but I will use it to show you how it works. Um, so in this scenario, I'll just grab a test file. Um, and I have an input folder somewhere on my desktop, maybe and I use it to archive or sort files on a server. Um, just one quick fix. Because moving files um, is probably the, the most basic thing that you will do, but it will already help you out with a lot of things. No more manual copying files from one place to another. And this also shows you a very simple way of using metadata. It's creating a folder based on the file type um, and puts a, a file in that subfolder. A hot folder is one thing. Um, Switch, of course, does a lot more than hot folders. We could add, we could monitor um, mailboxes, uh, inboxes. We could monitor FTP servers. Um, there's almost any file receiving technology that we, um, that you can think of that switch could be using or to, to automatically download and transfer files into your uh, local environment or even your cloud storage environment. Um, a next step would be, um, so I, I mentioned that this environment, this user interface is not what you actually would be using. 
what Switch comes with is a web portal. And this is how you interact uh, with Switch, uh, not the flow building uh, interface. And it's, I think it was also shown in a nice way in the, the, the movie that we saw. They, they dropped files onto the web portal. Um, they entered the metadata and the metadata is already structured the moment the file comes in in Switch. Um, and if you see now in the output, we use that metadata to create uh, the folder structure the way that you set it up to be. So if you already work with a specific folder structure, there's no need to change the way that you work. This is manual uh, metadata entry. Uh, in most cases, you already work with an MIS or with a, a system that can provide you with data. And in many cases, that data is XML structured. So a next step would be to automate that part. Um, so some of your files will be uploaded manually. Some of your files can come in from your web to print uh, and so on. In this case, I will be the web to print and I will copy the file and the XML into switch. Um, if I look at the XML file, it's very simple. It just, it adds some value and I entered data from XML file as an example of how switch can use XML files um, to, to automate your, your tasks. Switch is not limited to XML. It can use any kind of data files, JSON files, um, coming from web services and so on. So in this example, the XML file was used to data from XML file to create that structure. This is all still core technology in Switch. And I mentioned the integrations um, as the, probably the, the, the strongest part of Switch. And that's why I created this quick flow. Again, it's using a submit point that is available in the web portal. Depending on the file type, it will open Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, and so on, and convert it to a PDF. So again, as a user, um, I would um, submit my files. And I have to make sure that I use the, indeed, the correct file type um, or submit point, I use the Photoshop file and it's it's a, yeah, I can enter some random data. Uh, this metadata fields are completely customizable um, from inside your workflow. You could ask the user for all the data that is required. And what you will see now is a switch. I'm not touching my, my laptop at the moment. So you see Photoshop is opening. Photoshop is converting that file into, um, I configured it to convert to PDF. So the output would be a PDF file that is then stored uh, in the folder as this. So I have the original PD PSD file that switch moved in the PSD folder uh, and the PDF file that's inside the PDF uh, folder. Again, this is how I configured it. It can be completely customizable. If we take this flow, which is pretty simple to set up once you understand the, the how to work with switch, um, it's an example also of how you could extend and keep extending and add features to the, the workflows. So the next step for us would be we have PDFs, so we want to pre-flight it. So it's I use the submit point again. Um, again, it's the same flow, but what I added is that the converted PDF file will now be sent to pit stop. And that's something that Andrew will talk more about. And then we'll store the, the, the pre-flighted file on the server again, next to the pre-flight report um, and so on. File, and I have a file called, I do a very uh, simple pre-flight check where I check for a Embed fonts, um, and if it's not embedded, of course, I don't want to print it, or I don't want to send it further in my in my workflow. So let's have a look at what's happening in the flow. It's a PDF file, so it will not be converted. It will be sent to pit stop. Uh, pit stop will do the pre-flighting. 
um, it generates a report. And if we now look at the output, um, it created a structure where I have the PDF. It's in an error folder. I get the pre-flight report saying the font is not embedded. So this is probably already making your life easier. If this is something that you, you do manually, um, you just get the file. It even is converted if it's not a PDF file. Uh, you get a pre-flight report and all that you have to do is look at the server, check the report and do what you need to do. Um, this is still manual tasks. And I think the automation will always include manual tasks. There is no way to have a completely automated uh, workflow if there is no way to manually overwrite um, or manually interact whenever automation is not capable of um, doing what it should do. There will always be exceptions. And that's also how Switch is built to be, to be able to handle those exceptions. And I will do the same thing again, upload a file where the font is not embedded, um, submit it. Um, but the different thing now is that and we can have a look at the flow again. So the same thing as the previous flow, but if there's an error, it will be sent to a checkpoint. So we have submit points to manually upload files to switch. We have checkpoints to manually fix things that cannot be fixed automatically. So I, as a user, as a prepress operator, I now see that there is an alert shop. Um, I can process it. I can check the report from inside my browser. It's the same report that I showed in the previous example. The font is not embedded. Um, I can either edit it if it's exam um, so it's opening in preview uh, on my system. But this is, if it's an Illustrator file, it will open Ill Illustrator. If it's any specific file type, it will always open in their native application. I can then fix it. Um, replace the file, but in this case, I already have the fix available. So I have the embedded version. I had a remark, um, embedded font, and I say it's okay. These options here, they're completely customizable as well, and they directly re, um, linked to the options of the checkpoint. So there can be multiple options here, depending on how your workflow is built. So I say I fixed it, it's okay. I push it to the okay connection. And if I now look at the, um, what is created, I think it was notice two PDF. The original file is there, uh, error. I have, yeah, it's still, in XML format, but of course I can extend the flow to make this more clear, but my remarks are here. I embedded the font, uh, not embedded, and it's fixed, the font is uh, embedded. And this is how you, you build flows in Switch. There is also ways, because I mentioned that this user interface is not what you would use in your day-to-day -day or your, your daily job. Um, there are ways to, to create uh, dashboards on top of the, the flows. Um, so I can quickly show you um, how to do that. Job boards demo. Um, so you could really visualize uh, what's happening in Switch. You can uh, select the different stages in your flow, receiving, and I'm just gonna make it really simple at this time. Uh, converting and maybe archiving, converting, archiving, and I save it. Um, of course, I have to make sure that this flow is running. Um, and as soon as this is running, you would see files being moved from one stage to the other. Yeah, it's moving too fast at the moment for the, uh, this example. Um, but you can really visualize what Switch is doing without having to look at these flows. Another way to do this, um, and it's built on this column view that I showed you now, is to really simply 
at a dashboard um, and it's immediately showing everything that's happening in switch. I could link this to a dynamic table and list of files that are in this stage as well. So this is how switch works. You, you can really start small from moving files, um, adding more and more integrations, um, and then visualize it in the, the web portal uh, the way that, in a way that you can easily monitor it. Um, and just to, just to show you that Switch can really do everything or some basic examples, I use it to clean up my desktop, for example. So before a presentation like today, I start this flow and my desktop is cleaned except for the files that I would need for that demo. Um, so once you, you get Switch running, and that's also what we hear from customers, it's they use it for a use case or to solve a problem. Uh, but once it's running for six months or a year, they really start to think with everything they do. Um, they start asking if Switch could do it. And in most cases, a problem is solved by adding another uh, flow into Switch. I also liked in the, the movie that was shown that they, they added flows based on customer requests. So as soon as they have a customer requesting something, they're able to fulfill that request by just adding another Switch flow or extending one of their flows to handle what the customer wants to provide. Um, now back to what we can do for Inkjet or how we work with Inkjet. And I, I want to show you some web pages on the website first, or maybe I should first um, go back to the slide. So I mentioned uh, we work with integrators, we work with uh, solution partners, we work with resellers. Um, they're really switch experts. Um, and if it's something is not available out of the box, switch comes with this entire scripting environment that was, uh, we mentioned it already a few times. So everything that is not available to fulfill or to fix what you want to fix, uh, it can be built. Um, by one of our integrators, or maybe you have the, the know-how in-house. I mentioned in the beginning that we support a, a standard version of JavaScript. It's, it's easy or the, the resources to learn it are available everywhere. So the things that are not available can be built. Um, what is available out of the box? A lot. Um, and I have to keep scrolling just to show you, okay. So we have all these categories, all these out of the box integrations that are available um, in different categories. And there are two ways that these out of the box solutions uh, come to exist. Um, one way is the, the, the software vendor itself builds the integration. Uh, another solution is that an integration is built by a switch integrator and then made available on the app store. Um, so we have the partner solutions, but then also apps that are built by our users, by our integrators and so on. Um, and I think it's interesting to say that these apps, the users built, the integrators built, and also the, the, the elements that are built by the and focus partners but also all of the elements in Switch um, that are available from and focus, they're all built using the same scripting environment. So it's not that we have access to something that the user has no access to. We have a Switch scripter that you can use to build or you can use or um, that is used to build these integrations to, to create the element that's actually used in Switch. It's the same environment that we at and focus use uh, that is available to every every switch user. Some some solutions that I listed that I think are worth mentioning in chat specifically, um, and maybe it's not worth showing the flows, but it might be more interesting to show um, in the the list. Of course, we have a lot of uh, we have integration with variable data. Again, these are the ones that are out of the box available. If you work with a product that is not in this list, it can be built in 99% of the cases. Um, so variable data, imposition, tiling, ganging, all these things 
switch can work with. So again, this is not built in the, the core functionality of switch. It's not the goal of switch to do these things. The goal of switch is to, to automate what you have available. Um, and you could start by looking at the list available on the website and maybe you find the products that you already use and then simple, easy to get started. You could just download an app from the app store and I'll see if I can find um, an example of something I haven't installed yet. Webhook message. Um, get it now. It's as easy as installing an app on your phone. Um, Just be aware of the time uh, too. Yep. Um, and that's how you extend the functionality of Switch. And there are a lot of indeed inkjet specific uh, solutions available. Um, and if not, you work with one of our integrators. And that's more or less the 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 part of switch that I wanted to mention. So I would like to give the um, stage to Andrew um, somehow. Okay, so I'm assuming I just start the presentation, Morton. Yeah, I can do it for you. So it's very okay. easy. Here we go. Okay, and navigation is pretty simple. Okay, so I'm going to take about hopefully around 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to talk about the aspect of, of PDF in this whole equation um, because we're talking about manufacturing really now. Printing is, is used, you know, talked about as a manufacturing process and a manufacturing process starts with raw materials and in, uh, in our world, uh, although there are multiple file formats in things like high-speed inkjet, the raw material typically tends to be PDF. Um, just a quick bio about me, um, I, I, because I was a latecomer, I just wanted to point out I'm actually quite heavily involved with a group called the, the Gemp Work Group, I'm a technical officer there. I'm also involved in ISO, um, in the graphic arts standards, and I'm also the senior product manager in Focus responsible for Pit Stop, which is why I'm talking about PDF. So, if you look at the way the industry's gone, and I'm, I'm, if you like, I'm fortunate enough to have worked with PostScript. Um, in the early days, when we were dealing with PostScript, we all thought it was too slow, it took too long to rip. Um, we could never get to the plates to the press in time. We could never meet deadlines. So things improved with PDF in that the files became more efficient. But of course, everything else changed as well. So the presses got faster, the deadlines changed. So. <laughs> From a pre-press manager point of view, whenever we seem to make a technological gain, we seem to give the benefit away uh, in some way or another to the user. Uh, and that's just the reality of, of the, the world we live in. So being able to process files um, quickly um, and make sure that you can meet the demands of the press and the speed of the press is pretty important. Um, probably more in a roll-fed machine because you don't want to end up printing white paper or slowing it down. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about how you can make your PDFs better and some techniques that you can um, use and things you can try. The first thing I'm going to talk about is the GEN output suite. Now, this is something that a lot of people know about, but it's always worth mentioning. Um, how do you know your RIP's correctly configured to handle a PDF? Um, and even applications like nesting and color servers and imposition, they rewrite a PDF. So the PDF you put in, you write a different PDF out. So how do you know that that file is being cor correctly created? So if you're not aware of the GEMP workgroup, um, gwg.org, um, we do a lot of best practices and things like that. I won't go into all the information about it because I haven't got time. But um, there is a free test suite there that you can download. And as an example at the top, um, it's a series of patches which represent all the different constructions you can get within a PDF file. And the idea is that you run this through your workflow. So not just your RIP, your workflow, apart from your pre-flight solution. You shouldn't pre-flight it because then you'll break it because it's handmade. Um, and the idea is that if it finds a problem, you will get that very obvious cross come up and you will know that your workflow or your product or your RIP is not correctly configured to handle that kind of PDF construction. There's the link there where you can download it. 
um, and there's full instructions on how to use it. If your um, vendor is a member of the GEMP work group, then you will also find their application settings that will allow you to configure your device or application to correctly work with these files. Um, and I've named a few there, AG for Canon, Dial, MEFI, ESCO, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that could be very useful, even if you know, you're, you're not set up for it, it and you just want to do a little bit of investigation. And you want to understand a little bit more about your workflow. That could be very interesting if you just download and just to, uh, to play around with. Next thing to talk about is files that block production. <clears throat> and I had this slide for about 15 years, and it's as relevant today as it was 15 years ago. The further down the line you find about a problem, the more money it's going to cost you. Seems pretty obvious, but it just makes sense to talk about it. So the idea is to find, obviously, about things early on in the process, preferably before you even start spending time and effort on producing them. The way to check a file is, is pre-flight, which is kind of a, a term that used to be extremely important uh, but about 15 years ago when PDF was less um, standardized than it is now. But it's still important today. Think of it as an insurance policy. And I think of it as three different things. One is the general quality assurance to make sure that the file is going to be produced as it is meant to be produced, that it meets the quality standards you expect. The second part is compatibility. So is it compatible with your workflow? Are there things in there, elements in there that are going to cause problems either um, in the applications or in the RIP and um, things that aren't going to be handled correctly? And then the third part is the printability and the usability. And that's things like ink coverage and small tie out of multiple colors, um, objects too close to the trim that are going to get trimmed off. The, the, so basically the design. So those are the three aspects on checking. And what we see now is that with all this increased automation, obviously the goal with a lot of these jobs is not to touch them. You know, the margins are so small on all of this work that if an operator has to get involved, then you start losing money. And one of the problems is that a lot of these issues are not visible. Uh, and also it's perfectly possible to have a technically correct PDF file that when you introduce it to your RIP will you know, bottleneck it and um, throttle it for, you know, considerable time, causing you a problem in production. So things that you should think about <clears throat> for, uh, for checking, not so much the quality, but for these, these hidden kind of problems. One is file size, um, which sounds a bit, bit crazy, but it's not uncommon. We've seen gigabyte um, files from uh, InDesign, for instance, and 980 megabytes of them are metadata, so nothing to do with the file. So if you don't need the metadata, get rid of it. Um, excessive image resolution, uh, that's been around for years. Um, just remember that when you modify an image, you actually change the compression on it. So make sure when you compress it, you put it back at a decent resolution for the result you're trying to achieve. Uh, excess image data. So we used to call that rebate. I don't know if that's still a term that's been used, but you know, you have more image data in the file than the frame that it's sitting in. Um, so get that cropped away. InDesign does do that, but you have to turn that option on. Um, complex graphics with excessive nodes. I've got some good examples in a minute, but when you place a graphic into a page layout application, you place the whole file, not just the bit that you're viewing in uh, in the uh, application itself and when that pdf's exported those excessive objects are not cropped away so getting rid of those can also be uh, a, a good thing to do the uh, unnecessary use of transparency so where well, you can use overprint don't use transparency um unnecessary use of transparency groups that often comes down to the design and a lack of knowledge with the person who's actually making the job um, and then unneeded data outside the printing area. So things outside the, the bleed box, you know, designers leaving things hanging around that, again, have to be processed. Um, and then the same with clip paths, data hanging around there. And multiple font subsets, that's another one that will slow your rip down. Unnecessary color conversions, and there, I could go on. 
but I haven't got time. But I just want to show you a couple of examples that I'm sure you're going to appreciate. <clears throat> On the left, you see the, the page. So there are seven skeletons. The graphical file, which I presume is probably Illustrator, was one file with seven skeletons in it. So those seven skeletons were imported seven times into the file, ending up with 49 skeletons, which have all got to be processed by your output device when you send that job to print. And probably that was imposed, or probably wasn't stepped, but it was probably imposed. So it may have been two up or it may have been four up. So you can imagine that uh, that took a lot, of, lot longer than it should have done. And then here's a, a lovely one that was sent to me. Um, if you try and open this in it, Adobe Acrobat, of course, it will take about five minutes to open. But if you're working automated, lights out, no one's going to do that. So you can see the map as it viewed in Acrobat. The, the black object next to it is the wireframe view, um, which, as you can see, almost looks solid black. When you zoom in, um, you can see the street outlines there. So that sort of uh, tartan pattern that you can see at the bottom is actually a solid blue, but this has come from a CAD system. So it's all made up of individual objects. And you can see there, I've highlighted it in red, this file actually contains 15 million anchor points. So 15 million nodes that the RIP will have to process or the color server will have to process in order to work with this file. That's bang on 10 minutes. I did really well. So uh, just some food for thought. Um, I think my details are around. So if you want to talk about anything like this, you're very welcome to contact me. Um, to be honest, um, guys, uh, this is what I like about these uh, sessions so much because uh, we call them Learn With Us. And it is uh, very educational. Um, Gene, can you just check your Skype because I just sent you a message that is important that you do. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, because we are running a bit late, uh, we will also uh, fast forward. With, uh, we've got one question from a, an audience, and then I have some questions as well. It's uh, Uwe Alexander, and I think you actually showed that uh, uh, tune, but he says, what about funds? How will external funds be handled? Uh, if, uh, is there a possibility to connect to a fund server? Let's get that answered right away. Yeah, so the way I showed it was uh, I open it manually, and if I have the font on my system, I can embed it and re uh, replace the, the PDF uh, with the embedded, uh, the, the PDF with the font embedded. Uh, of course, if you talk to the integrators, they, they'll find ways if you have a font server and so on. Um, everything I've showed you that's being done manually um, is just an example of the way that we could do manual tasks in an automated environment. But what I've shown you is definitely uh, auto possible to automate as well. Mm, perfect. Um, uh, when I looked at your presentation, um, uh, Andrew, I couldn't help think about it, especially the last uh, this last slide where you show all these uh, uh, <laughs> these uh, <laughs> this crazy map with all the fifteen million uh, endpoints in 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 that uh, in that uh, perspective. Can't help think about. I mean, it's, you know, people can think that it's maybe the designers that are stupid, or it's the programs that are using are stupid. But that is not even the case here. This is how people work, and that is basically so. You take the pain out of optimizing it manually, right? People have to deal with this, Morton. You know, yeah. um, and I, I, I did have another slide. I think I forgot to show it. I think, but the, basically, the strategies around this. You know, you've got no margin. You've got tight deadline. Um, what do you do? You know, how, what's the best way to get rid of it? I had a very interesting conversation with one of your Scandinavian colleagues. I won't mention his name. And he told me that they they were moving from offset into digital. Um, and they'd lost money on, on the digital side and they mm -hmm. had to make some changes, but they understood why. And I, I said, well, tell me, I'm, you know, I want to know. He said, we've got an offset mindset in a digital world and we're trying to make the file perfect and we're not making money when really we should just be printing it as it is because the digital devices are actually more forgiving than the offset devices so yeah. it's retraining it's reorganizing the workflow it's you know horses for courses it's it's 
customer ex- expectation, customer price, margin, they all come into mm. this. There's ways you can fix it. But mm. that file there, was it really worth spending two hours trying to do it manually? Yeah. Or did you just want to turn it to an image and just throw it at the rip? And that's mm. that's what the guy did. Mm. And I can I can help because uh, Monday we had a session with uh, Chris Schuwalter from EFI. And, uh, I, and you know, as also the rip and the digital front ends are very important components. I mean, the, the, I think that the collaboration from a IT perspective where you see that uh, an, an improved organized file that gets from you to the rip yep. will improve the rip time, of course, but it will also eliminate errors that can't be uh, found by the rip because the rip serves other purposes, right? Exactly. The, the processing has got to happen somewhere. You know, yes. You know, it's It's got to be fixed or sorted or adjusted somewhere. So where yeah. do you do that? Do you do it at the rip when you're trying to get the file out or do you do it uptime where you're upstream where you've got a little bit of time um, and it actually is more efficient to do it upstream? Mm. When people are, I, I won't say they are reluctant to, to uh, IT uh, automation, workflow automation, but I think they they still have like some, Mm, potential pain stakes in, in their in their mindset to go there. Uh, I think that you know, from a pure financial perspective, it makes a lot of sense to automate as much as possible as fast as you can. But also from an error proofing perspective, it should make a lot of sense to do that. So when you and your partners addresses customers or get approached by customers where you where you look into uh, these obstacles, how how do you help people to get? You know, uh, from uh, being like, oh, this is great, but I I don't dare to get into this to actually say this is something I want to embrace. And this is something I want to learn from. How how do you do that as a, that as a company? Should I take that sound? I mean, Toon has no sound. Uh, oh, okay. Andrew, ha- Andrew has no video, so it's fantastic. Okay, let me talk. Um, <laughs> it reminds it, me of an old film from the 70s. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it's it's the approach. What, I mean, typically what, what we do, pe- people want to get into automation because they've got a problem. Yeah. And it may be, may be a competitive problem or it may be that they, they understand that their, their workflow is not – or their, you know, the classic one is their workflow is not fast enough to, to – you know, feed their lovely brand new press that they just spent two million euros on um, and they don't understand what's wrong, you know. And the, the thing is, they didn't think about the big picture. They just thought faster press is better, whatever. We can we can discuss that for all day. It, it used to be that in the past, but it's maybe different now. Yeah. Um, so people have, have a more un- understanding that you have to look at the whole thing. So when we when we first go in, we're probably looking at solving one major pain point. Um, and... That's where we get the interest. That's where we solve the issue. That's where we get the ROI, or that's where the customer gets the ROI. When we fix that, what's next? And then what's next? And then what's next? And then what's next? And then, as Tone said, they get to a point where they understand it enough that the way they fix the first pain point, they know they can now do it better, and they can do it themselves. And then they understand that they could do this. So, and if they added that, they could do this. And they could. So, the, the best description I ever heard was a, from a customer who proudly showed me that he was using Switch in his accounts department. Was it's like a spider's web? It just disseminates throughout the business. Whenever there's some inefficiency of somebody doing something mundane and tedious and monotonous, well, we can do Switch and use Switch and automate that. But it starts and, with a, with a problem. That's that's the key the key part. But I can tell you what's next now. And the next thing is two things. Uh, one of the things is that we have a wonderful session with Monty uh, talking about paper in a second. And another thing is that uh, I know that in focus is uh, uh, always very responsive and very open to talk to customers. So I think that if you have. Uh, any concerns or speculations in going into this kind of thing? Uh, we have shared tunes and Andrew's uh, LinkedIn profiles here in the chat. And uh, I just want to thank you very much for a very uh, well organized presentation. And uh, I think it was great to learn from. And I just have to kick you out now because we have <laughs> two minutes for the next. No session. problem. Yeah. Nice to see thank you again. Thank you. thank you very much. It was wonderful. See you soon. Bye. See you soon. Bye.